everybody, and welcome to Time Out Live. I'm, of course, Kevin Gallagher, and uh, this is a show I've been looking forward to doing for about two months now, because we were going to do this show last month, but Comcast was closed, and we had to reschedule it, so it gave me another 30 days to work on it and look forward to it. We like to come to you live about every three months or so into your living room or wh wherever it is you happen to be watching the show. We have... Uh, a great show on for you tonight. I don't know how a lot of you are going to handle this information. I don't know if we're going to get a lot of calls or none. You may be picking your jaws up from the floor. Who knows? But uh, we have Dr. David Lewis Anderson on the phone from New Mexico, and he researches time and time control technologies, and that's what we're going to be getting into tonight. So if you've got a close friend that lives in this viewing area, get on the phone right now. Dial the 10, because now you got to dial the area code, those 10 digits, and tell them to put this channel 23 on right now. And um, time is a very interesting thing. We, even the name of this show is Time Out with Kevin Gallagher. It's even contained in the name of the program. And Time Out, as we do in sports, we're stopping time, right? But not exactly. This man's actually figuring out ways to stop time. And they could go forward faster and go backward. And all sorts of neat stuff that we're going to get into. 792-4101 is the telephone number to call in tonight. We will be taking your questions. Please call in. We want to hear from you on this subject. Dr. David Lewis Anderson, I've got his bio right here. This is amazing stuff, Dr. Anderson. You were born in West Virginia in Wharton, and uh, you're a physicist. You were employed at a young age uh, by the United States Air Force, conducting advanced research and development at the prestigious Air Force Flight Test Center in Edwards, Air Force Base out in the Mojave Desert. You later founded an organization known as the TTRC, or the Advanced Time Technology Research Laboratory that was located out in Long Island. Um, during that time, you proposed uh, detailed theories for reversing time at sublight speeds and laid the foundation for what would later become known as time warped field theory, an approach that modeled and described how to use the natural forces, and we'll get into this, folks, inertial frame dragging for power generation to create uh, contained and controllable fields of closed time-like curves. He's been on Coast to Coast AM. If you listen to Coast to Coast, you heard him back in January. Blew my mind. He was on a friend of mine's show that I've had here, Freeman. That blew my mind again, and you've caused me, sir, to lose some sleep some nights. And <laughs> I won't hold that against you. And I hope that tonight you're able to make a lot of people lose sleep because it was mind-blowing. Dr. David Lewis Anderson, welcome to the program. Hello, Kevin. It is such a, a pleasure to be here on Time Out with Kevin Gallagher. And uh, I, I can't uh, ask for a better intro. I, I think it's very exciting what's happening in the world today. Uh, the, what's being learned about time control technology, not just at our institute, but at other facilities around the world, is really positioning itself to change our world and our realities in ways that are very difficult to comprehend. And I can't think of any better place to be than on Time Out with Kevin Gallagher to speak about it. Thank you. Let me open up with this before we get into some other stuff. I have up on the screen your photo, and it says, Dr. David Lewis Anderson, time control researcher. Just Let's just, you know, hash this out. What, what exactly is the difference between, say, time control and, say, time travel? Well, as physicists, sometimes we're not too, too uh, brave at, at being heckled. So a lot of times when you use the term time travel, people chuckle a little bit. Uh, there's two reasons why we use the term time control. One, because we physicists are very sensitive people. We don't like people to chuckle at us. Uh, but it is true that time travel is possible within our laws of math and physics. But the other reason that we use the term time control, while the experiments being done around the world are remarkable and actually exercising time travel to different levels, the first products that most of your listeners will see in the marketplace will be time control devices. Hmm. Uh, for example, uh, they might see a, a chamber used in a, uh, a hospital that has the ability to slow down time, kind of like a stasis field. Uh, right. When somebody's injured, they can be put into a chamber to slow the rate of time to prevent damage while treatment is being prepared. These are the types of time control products uh, that will be fielded first into the, uh, uh, the real world mass market. That, that should make people go, what? I mean, why haven't they heard about this on all the cable news networks, Good Morning America, and a slew of other TV shows that I can think of besides mine? 
You know, it's, it's a really great question, especially, uh, Kevin, when you, when you really think about it. They're paying for it as taxpayers in this country anyway. Uh, I know you have uh, many people who follow you um, after your shows are posted around the world, but for those living in the United States, this type of work has been going on since as early as the 1960s wow. all around the world. Um, what's really exciting in the last 15 to 20 years is that the technological capabilities of the technologies have just grown exponentially, uh, which offers incredible promise uh, to, to human society as a whole, but also some risks that come with using a technology that can have some very uh, 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 perhaps unwelcome effects uh, if not used properly. Yes, I mean, we can spend hours and hours and hours on that. And, I mean, I had talked to you uh, doing the planning for this program, uh, and I kind of jokingly said, yeah, couldn't you, you know, build something that would be like a refrigerator that I could put my groceries into so that, you know, I would put it in there and they would never spoil because, for lack of a better term, a stasis chamber, I don't know what to call it. And you said, yeah, I could build you one, but it would be a whole lot of money. It was like $44 million, I don't know, something outrageous figure, but you're saying that can be done now. But just yes, abs absolutely. There's a couple uh, facilities, research facilities around the world that are actively experimenting with technology that can accomplish that. Yes, sir. And it would be expensive, slightly over $40 million, But actually, that, that's a big part. Another area that in the 1990s, uh, more than, oh, wow, uh, almost 17 years ago, when we were testing our first time work field generator, uh, one of our first uh, funding areas was for transplant organ preservation. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to call it a refrigerator because a refrigerator can be damaging to organs, uh, if you will, free the freezing process. Yeah. Um, uh, actually using a stasis chamber of types is a way that um, uh, is almost the perfect solution for that type of venue. So another good application for society in the medical field. Well, it's funny you bring that up because I just did a show a couple months ago with a friend of mine I've known for years, uh, Will Duff, and I know he won't mind me bringing this up. He was on my show. This aired publicly. Uh, he had both of his lungs replaced. He uh, had suffered from uh, cystic fibrosis almost his whole life, and the lung capacity had gone down to, like, nothing. So what happened is, you know, with some type of technology like this, you know, they would take the donor lungs, put them into a, a stasis chamber, for lack of a better term, get them over to him and it would be like they would have never aged, <laughs> excuse me, never exactly. aged or anything at all, right? Absolutely, yes. That's, that's uh, like incredible because to me this is like, you know, science fiction. I mean, and, and now you're telling me that they can do this now in the year 2010. You know, it's amazing, and many of your listeners will think that, that it's science fiction, but what's really fascinating is that a lot of this work has been completed. Believe it or not, a lot of the groundwork for the time control technologies used today were advanced in theories before 1950. Wow. Now, of course, many people... Are you still there, Kevin? No, I'm here, I'm here. Go right oh, yeah, ahead. Many people are familiar with Einstein and his yeah. work in special and general relativity, um, but also there was a mathematician, Kurt Gödel, in the 1940s, yeah. a German mathematician, who proposed a theory on how time travel to the past was possible without traveling faster than the speed of light, something that's held up to this day. And most of the technologies being used today, and there are many of them, um, are actually based on the work done in the first half of the last century. Now, isn't it true that the whole theory that nothing could move faster than the speed of light, didn't that maxim fall back around late 2001, 2002? Uh, actually, no, technically it did not because uh, there's a little bit of a misunderstanding many people have about that. What the, what the laws of physics state is that matter cannot trans, trans, um, uh, travel faster than the speed of light. Okay. However, information can. And what you're seeing in the news, as a matter of fact, just last month, China set a world record for uh, quantum entanglement and quantum teleportation. Uh, that's the passing of information faster than the speed of light. And that's something that I'd like to thank your listeners for, because while Russia really kind of broke the ground in the 1960s, it was the United States taxpayers that really advanced um, uh, the ability to pass information faster than the speed of light. And if people aren't familiar with that, take a look at some of the work funded by the government uh, through the NEC at Princeton University. Uh, the taxpayers actually paid for uh, those researchers to develop a system that could pass information faster than the speed of light backwards in time. Let, me, then, let me just stop you for a moment, because when you're saying passing information faster than the speed of light, 
what are we talking about? Are we talking about like an email? Are we talking, what exactly, how, how do you frame that so that the viewers at home understand exactly what you're alluding to? Oh, um, well, uh, in, in, in the area of, uh, let's see, let's talk about what happened at Princeton. Maybe that's the, the best way to say it. In, in the world of physics, uh, there's an effect called quantum entanglement or quantum, uh, quantum tunneling. And that's what these technologies are based on. For those who are technical, quantum tunneling, it's an evanescent wave coupling effect that occurs in quantum mechanics. And for example, the way it was used at Princeton University, Dr. Wang, what he created was a 10 centimeter long chamber. So imagine a chamber about four or five inches long. Huh. It was filled with a cesium vapor under the right laboratory conditions. And essentially what he did was devise a system where as the information was sent in one side of the chamber, it actually finished leaving the chamber before it finished entering. <laughs> it actually traveled faster than the speed of light. And um, it's amazing that that got such amazing press for about three weeks, and then it disappeared again. And this is the work uh, that was originally launched in the former Soviet Union, wow. Moscow Aviation Institute, and, and it's been built on since then. As a matter of fact, Japan is the leader now in this technology. They have a facility that is uh, just absolutely amazing building on that work. So I know there's a number of countries that are doing this research besides the United States. Why don't we get into that? And I know... From what I've listened to on Coast to Coast and a few other programs, you talk a lot about India as well. A absolutely. Um, it was interesting on Coast to Coast. Uh, I, I talked about China wanting to get in the game. We've actually met with their, uh, I've personally met with their National People's Congress for Education Science um, and their Ministry of Science and Technology. They've always had a strong desire to get in to this. Um, uh, but they have had limited success. But what's interesting is they are now making strides. And since they have the second largest R&D budget in the world, I would encourage your listeners to watch China. You'll see a lot of things happening. But there are wow. really five other countries that are driving this. In Japan, um, we have a partner uh, with the Japanese. We're partnering with the Japanese government. They have a lab north of Kyoto City in the mountains along the shore of Biwa Lake, where they do uh, spend a lot of time on transmission of information at faster than light speed or superluminal speeds is what you'll see typically uh, in the advertisements for that. Russia has always been involved in this. Uh, they did amazing work in the 1960s and 70s, and after all the turmoil there, they lost a lot of traction, but now they're picking up again. In the United States, of course, we have the Anderson Institute, but it's not just us. There's Area S4. Uh, there's Princeton University, which I've already mentioned, and of course, many people might be familiar with uh, Dr. Mallet at the University of Connecticut, who's got a lot of press lately about a new concept he has for uh, time control. And that's here where I'm so. sitting. I'm in Connecticut right now, so folks, this type of research is being done right down the road from us. Yeah, it's very interesting. Actually, the approach done, uh, the, the work being done by Dr. Mallet and ourselves is probably the most similar in the world, even though we're approaching it from two completely different directions. So I hope that maybe someday we might have a partnership with Dr. Mallet as he begins to expand that work. So and, uh, he's been actually, he's been all over the news, Discovery Channel, the BBC, and uh, for a new theory that he's proposing. Okay, so let's talk about what you're doing, your technology. What, what are, how, how did you figure this out? I mean, how, how did you uh, figure out that, yeah, I can actually slow time down or speed it up, and, and I can see very practical applications for this. I can also see good and bad, and I think probably, you know, for most people, myself included, I go, oh, mamma mia, that the bad far outweighs the good, but... From what I understand, we're, we're well beyond being able to debate whether or not this should be done. We're actually doing it. Uh, that's correct. And, and just uh, moving back just real quick. Go ahead. One of the most fascinating areas, though, in the world where work is being done, and we're partnered with them as well as in India. We can talk about that later. But the development effort uh, within India is larger than the rest of the world's huh. efforts combined. Wow. Why India? Well, a lot of people ask that question. Uh, technically, I have a personal opinion I'll share. I won't say that it's only based on my observations. Number one, the greatest challenge in becoming a good space-time physicist, and we speak to college students all around the world all the time, is that you have to remember is that we do not see the universe 
but we don't see our universe as it is. We see the universe as we are. We see it through our senses, which are flawed and very limited. We see it through the way our mind works, which is a product of our biological and cultural evolution. Mm -hmm. We really don't see the universe uh, the way it is. We see it the way we are. And what's interesting about India, their religious beliefs, their cultural evolution, their fundamental cultural basis is that they see the world as a dynamic web of information where everything is interconnected. Uh, they see have very interesting views in their cultural evolution that have developed over millennia with regards to the subject of time. So they don't have these barriers uh, of them that cripple them to being able to visualize and see what needs to be done. Huh. The, the second point is, and I think this is a big factor, is that the presidents in India, the leaders, are elected based upon their scientific promiscuity, mm-hmm. not their political promiscuity. Got it. So that you'll find typically the presidents of India have great scientific uh, knowledge themselves. Very, very interesting. Um, so let's now move forward into your technology. Let's talk about that. How, how did you get into this? How did the idea germinate in your mind? And, and let's kind of go bo- backward and then we'll move forward into that. Well, how did it germinate in my mind? I could just say by accident and just stop there, but I, I met your listeners would like to hear a little bit more, or your viewers. Um, the, um, I, I, this actually began when I, I joined the Air Force, uh, as you mentioned earlier, at, a, at quite a young age as a scientist working for Air Force Systems Command, also did some projects made out to DARPA. At the time, while I was in the Air Force, uh, I was working on very high-speed uh, navigation system and space-based systems, and during... Um, Uh, One of the missions, uh, it was a long operational program, about a year and a half we were doing, I created a a model uh, for what today is known as inertial frame dragging. And uh, what I noticed out of this, and it wasn't the core focus of the test, but what I noticed was a very interesting observation about space and time and the energy levels that would be needed to access or control time. And... Uh, that was when I first got, if you will, turned on to the subject. And I could not convince the Air Force to continue with the work, so that's when I left and began forming the Time Technology Research Center, which is now today the Anderson Institute. That's, that's very, very interesting. Um, now, you, you, your theory, I guess, goes into something along the lines of what we call inertial frame dragging. Is that correct? I think we just lost our guest. I think we just did. He, folks, he's on a uh, secured satellite line out in New Mexico. So what I'm going to do is hang up the phone, and I'm going to wait for him to call back in. The joy of live television in a disconnected call, isn't it great? What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to wait for his phone call. I'm going to share a little bit more information about him uh, with you that I have from his bio. Anderson is one of the first comprehensive overviews that he's done of the historical views of time, time control, and time travel. He has a documentary film out called Time Travel Journeys into Time. His ideas were later applied for the development of high-performance time reactor systems for energy production and time technology research, which is now known today for the uh, Anderson Institute that he runs. Uh, Twisted space-time around the Earth or any rotating body is... Now, basically, what I understand, and it would be better if he says it, is that uh, uh, as the Earth spins and moves through space, it's creating a warping of space-time, and that's the inertial frame dragging. Can pick up. I can pick up the phone? Okay, let's see if we got him. Hold on. I don't have him. I do not have him. Here, right here. Oh, there you go. Uh, just pick up where you left off, sir. Okay. Uh, where, where, did, where did you hear me last? Uh, let's see. You were talking about your own technology. Okay, yes. Uh, we, uh, uh, we, we, we stum- I stumbled into this by accident with uh, the uh, observation I made in uh, my work at Air Force Systems Command. Uh, and it had to do with a model uh, describing how space, time, and energy were all interrelated. And from there, I, I stepped out. I could not convince the Air Force at the time to continue the work, which is why I formed the Time Technology Research Center and later the Anderson Institute. Got it. And what we've done in the 1980s, 
uh, the late 1980s, uh, I, I formed the Time Technology Research Center. In the 1990s, we spent quite a bit of time advancing our first two generations of, of uh, time, uh, time warp field generators, we call them. These are systems in the laboratory that actually allow you to create uh, contained fields where you can actually, within the field, make time speed up or slow down. Huh. We call that, a t in, our, in our area, we call that uh, a time warp field generator. Wow. And we spent quite amount of time in the 1990s, if you will, making the technology safe uh, for testing procedures. And uh, in this last 10 years, uh, we've moved on to our third generation uh, time warp field generator now, and uh, our mission uh, in terms of operational test mission has greatly expanded. I love it. Your third generation time warp field generator. Oh, so, yeah, the first two, I got to tell you, it was a lot of work. It really? was a tremendous amount of work, yes. So, any problems? Let me cut to the chase. How much can you. Now, I realize up front that there's going to be some stuff you can't talk about, but I'm going to try to push the envelope as much as I can. Okay. How much can you alter, speed up, slow down time within your field? Okay, we can, uh, we can essentially, with inside that field, there's a few things that we can do. We can speed up time. We can make it move faster. We can slow down time and make time move, uh, move slower. Um, we can create um, uh, closed uh, fields of closed time-like curves and modulate them in a way that actually allows you to move an object uh, or a living organism or matter or information backwards into the past without them experiencing a regression in aging. A lot of people ask that question. Those are experiments that we can do with living organisms, including people. What we wow. started doing with, um, uh, in, in cooperation with our partners in Japan uh, is working on actually regressing time. And we've been successful in doing that, actually reversing, um, uh, regressing time quite aggressively. For example, where we'll use uh, blooming flowers and we'll cause them to regress and move back into their bud. The problem is <laughs> we, can't use that, we can't use that on love, other living organisms now because we have some technical problems that we have to solve, very similar to what we had with the other other approaches back in the All right, time. wait. So let me get this straight. You you set up your time warp field. You put a, a fully mature plant inside it, and you can, for lack of a better term, dial it back to when it's budding. Yes. Uh, until until okay. and, and and I have to I have to say this for your listeners. This is a very new part uh, of our technology, and we actually showed this at a uh, a lecture we did in New York recently. Um, what happens is, unfortunately, the field gets stable, but we actually see, is time actually reversing itself? Um, and you see that flower regressing in age. Unfortunately, the field becomes unstable, and unfortunately, that causes destruction of the living organism for different reasons I, I, I don't get into unless your listeners would be interested in hearing that. That's interesting. I do have three questions that came in from a caller, and caller, I want to thank you very much for calling in, 7924101, and make sure you're flashing that number up between now and the time we go off the air, okay, folks, so that the callers can see the number. 792-4101 is the number. And um, the first question is, I have three of them, how would time control be useful f for humanity, for us? Oh, it, it, it absolutely has <coughs> the opportunity to, uh, to change our lives in, in many ways that are difficult co to comprehend, both good and bad. We talked about some of the applications in medical, some of the first commercial applications of these new technologies your viewers will see, stasis fields, right? chambers that allow uh, test results to be cultivated at a much accelerated rate of time, providing in turn new cures for diseases. Wow. Um, you know, there's discussions about viewing and recording history. Huh. Um, even in India, believe it or not, they have uh, a drone system. There's a lot of concern, and we should talk about the risks of time control technology, but they actually have a program where they want to use drones to send them back in time, launch them to view and record history, and then to return. So, so uh, let me get this straight. If somebody wanted to record the assassination of Lincoln, they could go back and record it, but wouldn't you also alter the past merely by being there? You know, I, I, Kevin, I, I've got to say I'm, I'm so glad that you, you said that because, in, in all honesty, one of our greatest concerns are, are the risks. When we look at this technology, um, 
this technology is amazing. Uh, there are almost no limits to the how we use this technology to re-engineer historical timelines or to pull information back to the future from the future, other than the results are imagined from our imagination, which was really insufficient. And our biggest concern is you're absolutely right. When you when any time a time control technology is exercised in any form, whether it's just working with information, matter, or a living organism, um, you actually truly do affect the construct of reality. And that's one of the things that we realized. Um, a lot of these um, beliefs in the movies that we see, for example, parallel universe or the, the grandfather paradox. If I go backwards in time and kill my grandfather, my parents were born, so I wasn't born, so I couldn't travel backwards in time. Um, and uh, so, therefore, I didn't kill him, so I was born, and now I can go back, et cetera, et cetera. Right, it's right. Back on itself. The, a lot of people think that's what ha what's happened. It's not what we see happening in a laboratory. If somebody were put inside the chamber and moved backwards in time and actually uh, uh, terminated a, a previous generation, that previous generation would cease to exist. That object or living organism that was moved back in time could come back to the present, but the construct of reality would have changed. That, that, that living organism that went backwards in time would be there with the same DNA makeup, with the same consciousness, uh, but would, would not vanish out of thin air. That's one thing, the very valuable things we've learned both in India and uh, here, uh, is that, is that um, some of these paradoxes that people talk about that are popular in the movies are simply places where our rational minds bump into their own limitations. Now, you had, a, I guess it was called the Brothers and Sisters uh, research that you did with these seedlings. I believe that's the name of it, where you actually did this. So you actually saw that the, the, the seedlings that came from the earlier plants that you destroyed still existed. Was there any other anomalous type results along with that? Well, maybe I should explain that for your listeners. That, that was one of the most exciting uh, discoveries we made. Um, one of the things that, that I would say to the listeners, any time um, uh, time control technology is exercised and any aspect of history or reality is altered, there could be a butterfly effect or a mm. effect. And people are familiar with the term butterfly yeah. effect. That's the, 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 the basic concept that if a butterfly flaps its wings on the other side of the world, that tiny, m tiny movement might cause a chain reaction of events that turns into a disastrous hurricane on the other side of the world. Uh, just the illustration quick Question. for your viewers. Um, and that's the challenge. When we use these technologies, um, many things can happen and and we we do um and one of the things that we weren't sure about was exactly what you said so we devised this experiment actually one of our technicians a young technician made an observation they saw that the dna makeup of a group of plant seedlings offspring of a parent generation of seedlings we had the dna makeup didn't match that that we had in our test huh. actually let's let's go let me explain for you oh my we, god we we put we had a family of plant seedlings somewhere else in the laboratory. We took a, a group of those seedlings and we put them inside the chamber. We sent them backwards in time. We triggered an event that killed the, um, uh, the, 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 let's say, the grandfather of those seedlings. And then we brought them forward in time. Now, what you would think would be, and of course, the seedling was the seedlings in the chamber were safe and maintained. We included a DNA record. What was interesting, they were the brothers and sisters of the DNA of the plants that we did not use in the experiments, that were away from the experiments. But when they came back in time and we looked at their record of DNA, the DNA makeup of the plant seedlings away from the experiment actually changed. Oh, my God. So moving backwards in time. And that's the danger here. Um, you know, the... Uh -huh. the the danger of this technology, it's different than nuclear, nuclear power. You know, we, we, if we look at human ethics, as the human society has evolved on this planet, every time we've developed a new technology or more power, we've always developed a greater need for more right. responsibility right. to serve as a foundation for how we guided that. One of the challenges now is that it is almost incomprehensible for us to predict what are the consequences of using this technology because the web of independencies is so complex that it's very difficult to predict. And also, here's an example 
in our own laboratory where reality, the construct changed, the actual DNA makeup of a living organism changed, and we were unaware of it. Huh. We were unaware of it. So the process of altering time is very dangerous uh, and can cause some other negative effects. And, and maybe to answer your question more, um, there's some great opportunities for positives. There are a lot of people who don't want to just use time control technology for medical treatment. They want to retrieve future cures. Uh, All right. You go forward to get the technology to cure a particular disease. Yeah, maybe go back, go forward in time and bring back cures for diabetes, AIDS, and cancer, uh, or to bring back information of not just man-made but natural disasters that we could use to avoid um, uh, disasters and suffering uh, to human society. Perhaps, you know, prevent the assassination of Lincoln, Kennedy, 9-11. Uh, I mean, I can think of a million different uh, applications for that, but then we don't know, as you had just alluded to earlier, what the ramifications of those changes would be, because it would be kind of like a rippling effect, correct? Yeah, exactly. And, and maybe a small analogy, and, and believe it or not, this is very accurate. Um, it's very simple, but it's actually very accurate when you're inside this, this world of research. Imagine if you were, if you're listening, listeners and viewers, if they were to walk out into their front yards and there was a flower bed there, and they were to walk across the flower bed and return to the same point in space they would have essentially moved through space and back again, but they would have returned to the same point, but they would have changed the makeup of reality. There would have been living organisms there um, that they trampled on that no longer would exist. They would disturb right. the earth and the seedlings there that would have formed new life. And traveling through time is the same way. We can move forward and backwards in time and return to the same point, but when we do that, we actually can redefine individual lives and consciousness. It's also possible, answering the rest of your question, uh, that the very process of doing this can be dangerous um, if not used with, not, if safe procedures aren't followed. For example, it's possible that transcription errors could occur where the objects, the living organisms moving through time um, uh, might be, if you will, uh, their, their, their physical bodies aren't assembled back the same way to wow. get all those transcription errors. Um, wow. and, and actually, there's another downside, too. Unfortunately, with as much good as there is, there are many people who look at weaponization of the technology. Even some of the ministries of these governments uh, talk about the potential for the first great time war, where, where the weapons of warfare become time control technology and not weapons, other weapons of mass destruction. Wow. Now, let me just hold that thought. I wrote that whole time war down. Um, I got a couple more questions that came in, and I want to get through them as quickly as I can. Everybody, you're watching Time Out with Kevin Gallagher at the bottom of the hour. We're going to be here till 9 p.m. taking your calls. I'm on the phone with Dr. David Lewis Anderson of the Anderson Institute, who studies time and how to use technologies to control time, speed it up, slow it down, and make it stop. And they're doing this now, in 2010. If you've been watching the show, I'm sure you've picked your jaw up off the floor a couple times, as I've done throughout the broadcast. You had me at different DNA in these plants, by the way. I, oh, boy. Um, the, the question that I'm going to give to you here is, could we control aging? And what's in, I'm going to set that up with a question of my own, along with the controlling aging, is I'm 46 years old. Could I get into one of your stasis tanks and do what you did to the plant and bring me back to being 21 again? Okay. Um, the, the, the short answer to, to that today is we don't know. What we can do, uh, and this is, uh, this is something that I mentioned that uh, was proposed by Kurt Godel, a German mathematician back in the 1940s. What we can do, using a phenomenon called closed time-like curves, I know it sounds to many of your, your viewers it might be obscure, but look it up. It's called closed time-like curves. It's one of, there's two primary technologies for time control. One of them is based on time, closed time-like curves, the other on, on special relativistic uh, based technologies. And essentially, we can put in a living organism, a person in a chamber, speed up time for them, slow down time. We can move them backwards in time in our time. They're moving forward in time at a slow rate, but actually moving backwards in time uh, you know, to emerge at a point further back in time, but their age has not regressed. Right. It's very similar, if you will, to, um, let's say for an example, um, you know, uh, 
many of the paradoxes. It all has to do with relative time, but I'll so, get away from that just for a second. So let me interrupt you for one second. Would it be sure. kind of how I'm thinking of this is I'm, I'm imagining the Empire State Building, really tall building. As you go up the building, that's the future. As you come down the building, that's the past. So as you're going up the elevator, you're going, you're, you're in the elevator, you're, you're the same old person as you did from floor one, but you get off you know, the 90th floor and you're just kind of, when you walk off the elevator, you're on the 90th floor. Would that be a good way to put it? You're on the 90th floor, which might be 10 years in the past. However, you might have only aged uh, 10, or, uh, uh, 10 or 20 minutes, for example. But yeah. your consciousness in, in, your, in your reality, if you will, your awareness of reality, your time has moved uh, forward at quite a different rate. You have not, while you're in the chamber, you don't feel that uh, acceleration yeah. or movement back in time. It's only when you emerge. It's, it's like the, the twin paradox that we hear about. Right, in right. Years. You know, that astronaut who travels off to the distant star and returns 20 years later, uh, who left her twin brother behind, yeah. realized that she's traveling relatively fast, that why she only was aware consciously that she aged 20 years. Her brother, Earth, had aged 200 years, and her brother has been long gone. Not possible. Um, and, and, and that's a very fundamental construct that we've learned of our universe, is that uh, this view of time is, is in fact, very relative and, and uh, to the individual and specific circumstances. That's very interesting. I have a professor that's trying to call in to be on the show, and I'm sorry, sir, the technology just doesn't allow that. I only have one phone. So uh, is there, uh, just for the professor's uh, sake that's watching, could you give like contact information so he could contact you and 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 get his questions over to you? Absolutely. There's there's two ways to do it. Our our website uh, has a lot of free information, educational related. It's www.andersoninstitute.com, and you'll also find me on. Uh, I'd welcome anybody to join me on Facebook. The name is David Lewis Anderson. Lewis is spelled L-E-W-I-S, and I'd look forward to hearing from any of your viewers. Now, let me ask you this. In Star Trek, we see something called the Prime Directive about not interfering with other cultures and, and this and that. Could you see a Prime Directive being done for something along the lines of time travel? Because I see the same sort of interference being done either in the future or the past, and there would have to be some kind of code of ethics of conduct on how that would be done. I mean, it just seems to be what would have to take place. Yes, and, and, and that's, um, uh, they're, they're actually, believe it or not, we actually have uh, a series of proposal for uh, a solution for a World Time Council, and we've really? actually drafted eight rules and regulations uh, for that that are potential concepts. Uh, but a lot of it has to do with, um, without going through all those, which would be a long five-minute read, uh, would really focus on do not take actions without first understanding the consequences or, um, uh, uh, and maybe I'll touch on a few of them, don't impose a change upon the natural flow of, of history um, uh, by any type of, of action. Uh, don't recklessly mm -hmm. interfere with significant beings existing in the past um, or by an action allow that to happen. Wow. Um, don't engage in unauthorized travel. And that's a big part of the solution, by the way. Um, we, we need to, if human society is going to avoid the first great time war and many of the other disasters that could accompany this type of technology, we need to, to get transparency and disclosure. We need to launch an educational initiative. These things are underway. And many scientists are beginning to step forward now and more in the coming years. Wow. Um, we also need then to come up with a world time council, or let's call it better Kevin, a, a moral compass guided by human society as a whole, human consciousness as a whole, that determines not only how this technology can be used, but also how it should be further developed. And the fourth thing we need to do is monitor it. So not that we envision a, a time police, but we certainly envision a network of uh, devices that would monitor any time time control technology is activated. Now, I have a couple more questions that came in from the viewers, is, and also that professor that wanted to call in. If you have a question, call, and we'll write the question down, and I'll make sure that it gets asked. Is there any way to keep the safety concerns to a minimum? Oh, uh, this is a very, uh, a very, uh, a very, oh, boy. 
A lot of people think there is. A lot of people think, well, if we experiment in isolation, if we keep the energy levels low, if we use drones instead of sending people back who can accidentally interact in different ways, that this uh, will minimize the risk. And certainly uh, it could minimize the risk. Uh, but with this type of technology, again, uh, the, the gap between our ability for moral reasoning and the technological capacity and our ability to predict what the results of using this technology are, the gap has simply grown too, too large. And it's now almost impossible for our, our mental capacity to predict, predict what's going to happen when we use these technologies and also our ethical thinking to keep up uh, pace with these to avoid uh, misuse. And um, I, I, I think it, it, it's a very, very difficult situation because part of the answer is a lot of people would say, Kevin, why don't you just stop? There's these risks. The answer is it's too late. Too many huh. governments and private agencies are exercising time control technologies. So it's not a question of, of whether or not we move forward or stop. Um, we, we simply have to find a better way to manage the risks. That's, that's incredible. Next question. How can, uh, how can we keep uh, the technology from falling into hands of those who would mis misuse the technology? I think, in a way, my, my previous answer uh, might have might have addressed that. Um, you know, for those who have, have followed this, the first thing is we need the public to stand stand up, and and many people in in the scientific community, not those people who talk about it on necessary TV or the radio, but those people who are working every day now are beginning to become very disquiet on the subject and are really beginning to speak up in, in, in public, and and that concern. Uh, has been raised in almost every aspect of this research from almost every corner of the world. And while we see the benefits to be obvious and wonderful, now that this is no longer science fiction and that we may be changing the makeup of reality, um, we have to uh, begin, begin working on this. We need to begin uh, understanding how does this affect human evolution. And by understanding, by manipulating history, are we forcing unnatural uh, quick rate of changes on people as we move things forward and backwards in time are we bringing back or introducing viruses in either direction or or, or, or microbiological agents that will affect us right um, right and I, I probably didn't answer your question no that's the, it, Actually, it's mind-blowing it, stuff but let me cut to the chase again besides plants what other things uh, people animals any kind of vertebrae, inanimate objects have you sent backwards and forwards through time? Well, of course, information has been sent forward and backwards in time. Living organisms, including people, have been expo put inside time warp field chambers <coughs> to be exposed to accelerated time rates and wow. time rates that are slowed down. Um, fields, uh, human test subjects have been put in chambers, exposed <coughs> Uh, fields of closed time-like curves. To my knowledge, no human has ever been put in a field uh, that has uh, attempted to regress the aging process, if you will. Um, to my knowledge, that hasn't happened. It's really not a, uh, a very safe or, or wise proposal what, this time. Well, then let me cut to the chase again. What would you say is the furthest amount of time forward or backward that a human has actually moved forward or backward through time using this technology? Uh, to move back and observe, um, this is where I'm going to be a little bit limited. Um, we, were, we were moving uh, about 15 years ago, uh, we were mo about 10 years ago, we were moving objects back or, or living organisms backwards in time, uh, let's say uh, uh, measured in minutes, the ability to send information back forward and backwards and measured in minutes. Uh, the capability of the technology has increased in orders of magnitude, wow. meaning factors of hundreds. Wow. So uh, the ability to uh, these technologies, that's the real issue now. Now the potential risk of using these technologies uh, has grown greater. And I'm really not at liberty to talk about in detail, even though um, we do hope in the very near future to uh, show some videos of exactly some of the range of capabilities. I, like I said, I was going to try to push you as far as I could. I'm going to get to a question that came in from this professor that's been dying to talk to you. But he has here, I'm going to read it to you. What is the gravitational pull of the Earth's gravity? Does it have an effect on time as well as pull of the moon and also atmospheric conditions as well as gravitational pull 
uh, the sways on the universe. And that's from Professor Evans. Okay, Professor Evans, thank you so much for the question. Um, oh, wow, I want you actually, believe it or not, there were about four questions in, in, in that one. Um, you want me to read it to you again? No, no, I got it. I got it. Yeah. I got it all. Okay. It's, it's clear. Uh, first off, uh, one of the things that we've learned from our work, and this is a very subtlety, but since this is a professor, I'll be very specific. Uh, later, um, we don't use, we've, we've in many ways banned the term gravity in our uh, experiments and in our work because we believe there's two reasons why we do that. Number one uh, is as uh, when Einstein came up with his theories about time, he had the special theory of relativity and then later the general theory of relativity that talked about how gravity can affect time. Yeah. What a lot of people don't realize later in his life, Einstein says, hey, wait a minute, there's no need to have a general theory of relativity. It's included in special relativity. As a matter of fact, if you were to take an object for Professor Evans and put it in a free float frame, essentially special relativity works everywhere in the universe and describes gravity. Wow. The reason I don't like the term gravity is, Kevin, for your viewers, I'd encourage you, gravity is a label we put on something we don't understand. Uh, yes, in high school, we all learn about gravity, and we learn to write the equations that model how it performs. Right, 16 really, feet, oh, blah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 16 AT squared, exactly. Yeah. Um, but, as we, but do we really know why these objects are, are, are attracted to each other and pulled together? No, it's a label we put on something we don't understand. But with that said, yes, um, gravity uh, mm. does have uh, – gravity is simply, by the way – curve space time in action wow. as you bend space time gravity is created uh and, and that's essentially one of the new things that we see coming out of our work but huh. uh essentially it does have an effect on time it's very interesting that professor evans asked the question about the effect on the moon and the atmosphere right because what we haven't talked about on this show is that where does the power come from right one of the greatest achievements that we're proud of is that one of the things we accomplished was that we realized that time control was possible without the high energy levels previously thought required. But it still requires a lot of power. Where do we get it from? We get it from the curvature of space-time that surrounds the Earth. We're not creating it. What we're doing is harnessing a naturally occurring energy. And essentially, for your viewers, imagine you see the Earth spinning in space. Actually, what physics shows is that as the Earth spins, space-time is bent around it. It's twisted like a spring. And if you were to pull the Earth away, that space-time would snap back. And why the twisting is very small, the amount of energy is massive. And actually, I'm embarrassed to say, Kevin, in the 1990s, we never realized why we couldn't balance and understand the power that was coming out of our system. Well, isn't and this, just interrupt, isn't this is what, what was throwing our satellites off by like a meter or so? Absolutely, and that's the mathematical model, part of the mathematical model I developed when I was working for Air Force Systems Command. So you're the guy that figured that out? Yes. Okay. I, was, I was one of the first people to actually document the uh, mathematical model that described why our satellites drifted in space. But essentially, because we're harnessing that, uh, that's where the power is coming from, and that's what a time warp field generator does. It harnesses power naturally occurring. It concentrates that curvature of space-time into smaller fields of closed time-like curves. But going back to Professor Evans' question now, when a time warp field generator is activated, it's pulling power out of that curved space-time around the Earth. And people ask the question, well, you can't get anything for free. If you take power out of that, what happens? Well, the orbit of the moon changes. It begins to move further away from the Earth. Tidal patterns change on the Earth, uh, and the weather patterns change. But to give you an idea um, why that is true, the power levels we're talking about are so large that the effect of harnessing, say, the typical power used by the typical uh, entire population of the United States for... Um, 3,000 years would huh. only cause one ten thousandth of a second change in the time, the average time wow. of the day over 10,000 years. So while, yes, this can have effect on the atmosphere, on the orbit of the moon, tidal patterns, weather patterns, it does not, um, it, the risk um, is there, but it's not significant. But at the same time, 
I can't say it both ways, Kevin. We do have to understand the ramifications before we bring on um, what we call time reactor systems that harness that energy for clean energy production. So this is why, from what I've heard in earlier shows that you did with, say, Coast to Coast, this is the reason why you're putting in, you know, Y, this is the level of, you know, energy, and X coming out was always higher, and you were scratching your head? Yeah, actually, we believe, we actually are physicists. When we had our first two uh, time warp field generators, your, 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 your information is very accurate, Kevin, we had actually initiated a time warp field, which takes a lot of energy. It's very spectacular, by the way. What does it look but, like? But, what does it look oh, like? Well, I'll tell you that. Let me, let me finish answering. Go your ahead, question. go ahead. Go ahead. Um, is that once the field was formed, we noticed something unusual, is that in the 1990s, the power coming out of the generator was more than we were putting into it. And that violates the laws of physics and the conservation of energy. Right. It wasn't until 2002, uh, almost, you know, much more than 10 years later, that we finally realized what a time warp field generator was doing was not creating the energy, it was capturing the potential energy surrounding the Earth. Huh. And what does it look like? Um, um, well, there's two parts. There's two exciting parts of watching a time warp field generator in operation. Number one is when it starts. We, we have a very high power laser array uh, directed into a chamber. We have a rotating electromagnetic field and a chemical reagent. The laser fires, and we have a, a, a very dramatic combination of, of light and sound and energy. Uh, very, very colorful, wow. uh, very, very powerful. Once the field forms, it, it, it calms down, if you will, and you'll see what appears to be a water effect, but it's really the dopplering of light frequencies through the boundary layer of the field. What's really interesting for listeners or viewers, for the few people who have seen a generator in operation, is when they see um, the, the, the system operate and they actually see how it, accelerating, speeding up or slowing down time can actually be as simple as adjusting the volume on your radio, turning huh. that volume up and down. You actually can speed up or slow down time where you actually see objects that are falling begin to slow down and even stop, hovered in midair where the forces of, if you will, gravity, that label I don't like to use, right. gravity essentially disappears where time stops. And the reaction is a very emotional one. People laugh. People cry, people are stunned, and people usually call us back and say they can never look at their world in reality again because they see how little they truly do sense of what is very real around them. Hey, I gotta, I gotta ask you this before we get off the air. What, what is a TTD? A TTD. Uh, this is part of our our, our proposal. Um, a, a TTD stands for temporal tremor detector. For your viewers, wow. uh, let's call it a. Um, it's like a seismic detector used for an earthquake. Um, so it basically detects temporal tremors. Anytime wow. a time control technology is activated, it does create a pattern that is very, very easy to detect. And as we look at a solution uh, to ensure that this technology is used for the benefit of human society, for the Earth as a whole, um, it's important that we be able to monitor it. And our view is, and our vision is, is to take this technology and deploy it in orbit around the Earth uh, to monitor as part of the fourth step of our four-part plan to try to ensure this uh, technology is used to, you know, alleviate human suffering and improve, or improve uh, life on the planet. I'll tell you what, I wish I had another four or five hours to sit here on the phone with you, but I got just a few more minutes, and there's one thing I wanted to cover very quickly. Oh, they're saying five minutes. Um, there's a lot of people who believe that we shifted, I don't know what word to use, alternate timeline around 1998. What, what's your reaction to that? And also, there was a guy by the name of John Titor, if you're familiar with him. Um, what, what's your response to 1998 and John Titor? Okay, uh, 1998, um, for your viewers, uh, we talked earlier about an experiment um, where, where actually the construct of reality was changed without us not being aware of it. Right. Um, if we were inside that chamber, by the way, with those plant seedlings when we came out, we would have been aware that the construct of reality had been changed. But generally speaking, the population is not going to be aware of it. And, um, however, there is a small percentage of the population, people, uh, let's say 2% of the population, that have a natural gift or have trained themselves to be sensitive. And I have no idea what the what the the significance of 1998 is, but I will tell you this, we network all around the world, and I have never seen such an overwhelming outcry of people who say they have sensed 
a dramatic change, a re-engineering of the historical timeline wow. back in the late 1990s. It is, it is overwhelming. Uh, statistically, it is so, uh, so strong and, and so overwhelming that um, it, it's, it's amazing that it happened. But then again, we do believe that in some cases, the human mind actually could be a temporal tremor detector. Huh. Uh, and while we're not experts in that area, we do recognize that there are many possibilities, and so we don't judge it. We just try to understand and learn from it. All right. How about John, John, John Titer? Um, I, I can't say I know, uh, of course I know of John Titer. I have not been exposed uh, directly to his work or had a lot of communication with him. Uh, so I really, am, I, I don't feel comfortable okay. bringing a lot of comments, but I would encourage your viewers to study and learn and listen and make their own decision. Now, is there anything that we haven't covered over the last hour um, that you'd like to get out in the air before we go bye-bye? Uh, I think the most important thing is... Uh, if I could, I'll go real fast. Go ahead. 60 seconds or two minutes? Uh, probably about two, three minutes. Two or three minutes. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, for everybody, I would encourage you, as you look at time, you have to understand how much we don't know about time as a human society. It's important we all become aware of human society is going to benefit from this technology. Mankind and human society has been struggling for millennia to understand the nature of time and has, has been struggling and hasn't found it. It's now on the cusp of being uh, understood quite well, but we have to be aware of it. Uh, and you have to remember, we don't see the world as in our universe as it is. We see it as we are. Your mind, your human mind and your senses are like that old television set flying through the air with information and energy in the form of TV signals. You'd reach up to your television in front of you and tune that tuner, and you'd be able then to sense and see that information on that channel. And I have to tell you this, your senses and your human mind are like that tuner, but greatly limited. There's a lot mm. more to the construct of our universe and reality other be well beyond that which your senses can perceive. We can sense it with technology, but you can also sense it with the human mind. You have to wow. understand that um, I would encourage people to study and understand that time does not have one definition. People right. define it in Asia as circular. We define it as linear. There's cultures like the Navajo and Hopi Indians and the Paraha tribe down in South America that have no concept of time. They don't even talk about past. And we got to and we got to go bye bye. We're we're wrapping up. My one of my favorite quotes is uh, time is uh, God's way of making sure that things don't all happen at once or something like that. It's a good one. Yeah. And um, I want to thank you so much for being on the program tonight. Dr. David Lewis Anderson. Go to his website, AndersonInstitute.com, and check out more information. It's a great website. Got to have you on again. And I'm, of course, Kevin Gallagher. Good night. We'll see you on Friday night. Bye-bye.